Thank you, Marty. Uh, this has been a, a great forum, a great conference for an exchange of scientific, scientific information amongst a lot of us. Um, however, we have a problem, okay? We're not effectively communicating the truth about climate change. That's a problem. The general public does not understand the detrimental Im impact of artificially reducing CO2, and the political conservatives do not realize that this is a hoax and they will not touch that third rail. So let's solve this problem beginning today. So why is an engineer, a mechanical engineer, talking about this? Uh, we trust in the laws of physics and we verify all assumptions. Let me use this slide to, to demonstrate where I've been in my career, okay? All the way from Project Mercury, all the way to the space station, and Apollo and space shuttle in between. The one thing we learned in all these programs is that we believe in the laws of physics, we use the laws of physics, and we verify our analysis with tests and, and demonstrations. We've, we've done this religiously, and as Marty said, in God we trust everyone else bring data. So with, with this kind of background and this kind of rigor, then some years ago, we started the, uh, uh, the, the climate change and issues and formed the right climate stuff. Global warming is something I became very interested in in the 1980s because it was an issue that was everyone was talking about. The NASA chief scientist, I asked in Washington, D.C., Dr. Lynn Fisk, what was this thing about global warming and it, what was causing it? He said, it's a hoax, and he said, let me show you, Tom. So he showed me ice core data from the Arctic, which showed back hundreds of thousands of years, okay, of why that was a hoax. Then later on, a few years later, I met Leighton Stewart, okay? Leighton Stewart is the author of Fire, Ice, and Paradise. It showed it's a hoax. So with that, we formed the right climate stuff in 2011. So over the, the years that that organization has been in existence, it consists of chemists, engineers, astrophysics, and a lot of other geologists and meteorologists and PhDs. The thing that is, we are all former NASA people. We're not uh, uh, beholding to the NASA administrator. As a matter of fact, many of you have met or did meet uh, the recently deceased Walt Cunningham, Apollo 7 engineer. He and I wrote a letter to the NASA administrator in 2012, signed by 49 former NASA people, saying they are discrediting NASA with the, all the stuff that they had on climate change. We didn't believe it. None of us work for the big oil companies. We've got reputations we're protecting, and we're non-political. So this is a tribute to some of the early members of the right climate stuff. Leighton Stewart on the left, Walt Cunningham, as I mentioned, Tom Weismiller, and, and Dr. Harold Dwaron. These were all discussed last night and, and shown their, their contributed, what they did to contribute to the, um, the right climate stuff and to ICC. So here I am, I've in, after I've been, uh, we established the right climate stuff, I've taken it upon myself to talk to the public as much as I can. So I've talked to various organizations in Texas and New Mexico. I've talked to about a thousand people at these things. The most, most people are skeptical um, of the alarm message that's been delivered. And during these talks, they've understood and reinforced their position. Once they have understood the truth and understood it, then they can see why that they, uh, their, their basic gut feel was correct. There have been very few people that have challenged the facts that I've presented. As a matter of fact, no one in the audience of a thousand plus people have ever challenged it. Um, I've also written editorials for the paper and I've had one person challenge that, okay? So there's, there's many new messengers of the truth now 
and they're armed with copies of the presentation. I'm going to go through that presentation real quickly, not to, to, to convince you, but to show you the type of message that I've delivered, and it's gone over very well. This is a typical response that I had from one of the uh, people in the audience. He's a mechanical chemical engineer. He said he'd already been, always been suspicious, but the, showing the facts let him know that it was not being caused by humans. So today, I'm preaching to the choir. The problem is the choir is not singing loud enough with a simple verse. So Christopher Monkton, I don't believe is in the audience, but he was going to try and be here. Uh, this is something that he said, I'm going to quote it. How then are those uh, of us with a scientific interest in the objective truth going to make ourselves heard given the relentless propaganda? One answer is it will be necessary for us to refine and simplify our scientific and economic arguments to the point where ordinary people is possible, is, is possible can both hear and behold and understand our arguments. I totally subscribe to what he said, and that's what I'm saying in different words. The most important bodies in our universe are the sun and the earth. The most important things on the earth are humans, animals, and plants, as we've seen over the last couple of days. Humans flourishing requires reliable, cost-effective energy. So that means we need to have fossil fuels. Demonizing carbon dioxide impoverishes humanity, has no impact on the climate, negatively impacts the economy, threatens our national defense, reduces plant production, and there is not a climate crisis. So here's the message I've delivered. Again, I'm not preaching to you. I'm just going to use this as an example, which I hope a lot of you can help spread. And at the end of this thing, I'll, I'll propose a plan by with which to get it to 100 million people in the United States. So the truth about climate change is there are seven things, and I'm going to go through each one of these seven separately. Okay, global temperatures and carbon dioxide levels are in cycles, okay? And, oops, this is not going right. There it is. That's what I show the people when I do this, okay? Over 600 million years, you can see the carbon dioxide and the temperature changes. I'm going to go through these very quick because you've all seen them in other presentations. This is another thing just looking at 800,000 years, okay? Antarctic correlation of CO2, or Antarctic, Antarctic, I should say, core data looking at CO2 and temperatures. They correlate. There's 400,000 years. Temperature peaks, it's cyclical, okay? Again, demonstrating that. This is looking at the last 2,000 years. The important thing here is we're coming out of the Little Ice Age. That's good. Um, so now that we'll look at the thing, that the next, as again, I make seven points to all these audiences. The next one is temperature changes are caused primarily by the sun. There's, there are the elements that do it. The sun's heat, and it's captured somewhat by water vapor and carbon dioxide. There's a lot of other things that contribute, as you can see on this chart, causing global temperature to increase. This is the thing that I think explains most of it. The energy from the sun comes in, it gets absorbed, and it gets reflected on the left side. On the right side, that's what's radiating out from the Earth, and some of it is captured by the cloud formation and, and greenhouse gases. So the energy from the sun is because of activities on the sun, proximity to the earth, and this is best shown by this. The earth is rotating about the sun. It's an elliptical orbit that's oblique, that ellipse. The earth is rotating about its axis and precessing. All those mean the radiant energy from the sun normal to the earth is changing all the time. So, Mother Nature's in control, not humans. So here's a correlation of what it looks like with the sun activity on the left, the temperature of the sun, I mean the temperature of the earth is well correlated. If you look at the temperature of the earth 
on the Earth, global temperature and carbon dioxide, it's not correlated. The amount of human-produced carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is extremely slow, low. That's my fourth message. So here it is. Here's the big thing. Here's looking at water vapor, which is 95% carbon, carbon dioxide, which is 3.5%. But look at that percentage by man. It's, it's a tenth of a percent of carbon dioxide in greenhouse gases. Okay, here's a pictorial showing 10,000 dots represent the atmosphere around the Earth. In the lower right-hand corner is that produced by humans. That's 12 dots, not very much. Mount Pinatubo spewed, spewed out more greenhouse gases than all human race presented, produced in all years. Now, in all due respect to, to uh, Will Happer, okay, greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide does have an effect more so than some of the other greenhouse gases. 97% of the scientists' consensus says that humans are causing it. Let's look at that data, okay? There's the IPCC model that's showing, uh, going to the upper right, solar activity is going down to the left, and look what's happening in measured data. That doesn't correlate. IPCC is wrong. Al Gore said the ocean, ocean is boiling because equivalent 600,000 it, uh, atomic bombs per day, equivalent size of Hiroshima, and the ocean's boiling. I don't think so, Al. Look at the correlation with what climate models say and what's really happening. So the other thing is, the scientists said, global cooling, we're going to go into an ice age, and we would be in that by the year 2000. They're wrong. 97% of the scientists, by one estimation in 2013, showed that if they inferred anything about humans causing it, that's what they said is 97%. With another group looked at that, only three-tenths of 1% said that they actually said it. So scientists were wrong again. So weather extremes are not increasing. Let's look at the data there. Okay, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, wildfires. There are the major hurricanes at the bottom of that. It's staying flat essentially. And all hurricanes over the earth is at the top of the graph showing that they're staying about flat. Look at tornadoes. They're decreasing. Look at the, at the frequency of floods, upper left-hand corner. It's, it peaked again about the early 2000s. And it's coming down. Look at, at the drought index and what's happening there. It's staying flat. Carbon dioxide is not doing that. Uh, the acres burned. It's coming down. So with that, CO2 is safe and is, is not a pollutant. There's a demonstration how trees can grow by 70%, doubling the amount of carbon dioxide. Looking at some of the other effects of doubling carbon dioxide, of all the things of grains, vegetables, trees, and fruits, they're up by 40% by just doubling the carbon dioxide. So here's what's happening with people, okay? Uh, naval, uh, sailors on submarines can live up to, with 8,000 parts per million. Don't forget, we're living, we're breathing about a little over 400,000 parts per million here. Uh, they can stay that long for 90 days. NASA lets uh, astronauts stay in space station, 5,000 parts per million for three years. So all that is, I just repeated, I'm going to skip through that. So there's not a climate crisis. Carbon dioxide is good. The word, world needs reliable, cost-effective energy. Our message is not being delivered effectively. So who, who is objecting to that? Progressives, because they want one world society. Foreign countries, they want financial aid. Wall Street wants billions of dollars of commission. Greenhouse industries, thousand dollars in profit, billions in profit, et cetera, et cetera. So the alarmists have the money and large microphones. We have the truth. So let's begin today by looking at what we can do with that premise, okay? Let's establish a strategic plan. All strategic plans have mission, goals, and actions. Our mission ought to be, this is my suggestion, the U.S. should be the world leader in independent hydrocarbon production by 2026. That's after 2024. 
educate, the goal is to accomplish that mission, educate the public. Educate those with letting them know there's not a climate crisis, carbon dioxide is good and not a pollutant, cost-effective, reliable hydrocarbons are necessary for humans, animals, and plants to flourish. And we need to elect advocates for this, believe in this, by 2024. So what are the actions, okay? We need to create a national campaign. This big. We need to communicate this to 100,000 people. I've communicated it to 1,000 individually. I don't know how many of you have spoken to end of groups, but we need to do that. But that's not going to be enough. We need to have a nationally recognized credible spokesman or something that can deliver the message. And here's the biggie. We need to secure financial resources to do that. I think we probably need $50 million to do this over a short period of time. We need to flood the airways. We need to flood Fox News and CNN and some of the others with about five messages every single day, six days a week between now and 2024. That's going to cost a lot of millions of dollars. We need to support the national and state candidates who believe as we do. Okay? So we're not going to have the people, since this is the end of this conference, do this and establish and brainstorm a, a, a campaign strategy here. But I'm going to suggest that CFAX, CO2 correlation, the, the Heartland Institute, and others put together a small group of people that lay out a plan to do that. That's been discussed by a lot of people. You heard the senator talk about it today. You heard the lady congressman, congressperson, excuse me, uh, say the same thing. So the one thing that I will leave you with, let's roll before it's too late. So thank you. I look forward to your questions at the end of this. And our next speaker is Marty Cornell.